One day my wife came home and said we were getting divorced. And I tried begging for like three days. I did every single thing that the movies tell you you should do and it didn't work. How do you know that you should break up? Most relationships that break up should be broken up. Most people break up for valid reasons. If there is full on sexual cheating, that must be the end of that relationship. No, really. So how many breakups actually have a chance to get together and stay together? Many people assume you're done once, it's over. I very much disagree with that. How do you get through a painful breakup? And should you get back with your ex? And if you do, what's going to happen? These are questions almost everybody finds themselves asking at some point in the romantic life. It is swirling on the internet right now if you should get back with an ex ever or if you should say goodbye forever. And no contact in particular is a big topic happening right now all over social media. Today, we brought in a breakup expert. Cole, welcome to the show and help the audience understand how to break up. So Cole, I am the attachment specialist, and I think I'm gonna call you the detachment specialist here today. Amazing. Because you help people with their breakups. <laughs> what is, to get us started in this conversation, what's one thing that you wish people knew about breakups? I wish they knew that everybody's breakup is equally hard for them. I feel like a lot of people come to me and they're like, I only had a two month relationship and all my friends have been married for like five years and I don't know if I have the right to be sad about this. But I want to make sure everybody knows that like the connection that you had and that you lost is worth being sad about. It matters. And everybody's grief is the worst for themselves. So that's something I want everyone to know. So what makes a breakup so painful and so traumatic for humans? My favorite explanation is evolutionarily. So the way that I've heard it that's clearest to me is we grew up as hunters and gatherers. And during that time, we needed people to survive. Like if your tribe just picked up and left one day and you were left alone, you'd probably get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or you'd just starve because you can't live on berries or hunt by yourself, carry a buffalo by yourself. So we grew into these people that need other people around to survive. And that is still with us. So if your person leaves you, a lot of us can actually feel like we're dying. I, I did when I got divorced and I think a lot of people do. So I think it's so hard because we're bred for it to be hard so that we keep relationships at all costs. And this is so true, because the biochemistry backs this up. When we are bonded to somebody properly, we have that oxytocin bond, right? And it feels amazing, that's the love hormone. But once we lose that, it, we experience it very much like a withdrawal, like a drug withdrawal. Yeah. And so we go into a death spiral and we, we start grieving as if the person has died. And at the same time, we have this horrible chemical withdrawal happening in our brain at the same time. It's horrible, it's death. Mm. So how many, breakups can you go through until you damage that system permanently until you become permanently unable to face these connections and have to go through one more i don't like to believe that that's possible so we can have an <laughs> infinite number of breakups well i think yes you'd probably get eventually really depressed and not want to continue but i think that the thing that people need most in a breakup is hope that the future is going to be brighter Mm. And they need people to believe in them. And that's one of the best things you can do as a friend is if you see your friend going through it, believe that they're actually going to be happy again. Because at the time of the breakup, most people think that that is their last one. That is the end. Yeah. Yes, after, I'm after, never after, one, date again. after one, people usually think that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, at least for me, like believing that love was possible again in the future is what got me to keep getting up and, and got me to go and do it and go and find it. Now you said something interesting there, friendships and the building those bonds and those people helping you. And that, that tracks back with hunter-gatherers, right? If you feel abandoned, you feel alone, being reminded that you're not alone is very important. Same reason that we have many funerals and we gather after, you know, after somebody has died, we gather for that funeral and you remember that you're not alone and you reminisce in that moment, you form those new connections, the new oxytocin. How important is friendship after a breakup? And even more than that, like, what do your friends need to do, I guess, <laughs> to be useful to you after a breakup? 
So what most friends will do, and this happened, this happened to me after breakups and after I got divorced, is they'll go in and they'll tell you all the things that they didn't like about that person. Because they're trying to be a good friend. Like They're like, okay, they broke up, so obviously they're enemies now. So I need to be on their team by telling them all the things that I secretly thought was wrong with their partner the entire time. But to the person who just got broken up with, so if you're listening to this and you have a friend that's just gone through a breakup, or maybe you're going through a breakup and you need to help your friends help you, to that person, they're still in love with the person that they just broke up with. Maybe if it just happened like a week ago, if you go back in time one week, they thought they'd be with that person forever. They thought that going on dates was cheating. And now you're telling them that the person they're still in love with is terrible and they need to go and in their mind cheat on them by dating as many people as possible to get feeling better. And that doesn't really work. So the best thing you can do is just listen and be there. Most people going through a breakup need to repeat the same stuff way more times than you think they do. They'll, they'll tell you the story again and again and again. They'll tell you, um, like, how could they do this to me? And they just need someone to be a sounding board that they can get through those thoughts. Because the more times they repeat it, the clearer it's going to become to them and then they can move on. But if you're there just telling them that the person that they're still in love with is terrible, then that's not a very good sounding board and they're not going to be able to do that. Let me ask you this. Is this the breakup er or the breakup e? Because there's now two sides, right? Yeah. Is this the person who just, you know, was thinking that their life is fantastic, the next thing you know, the door slams, you know, the couch is gone, <laughs> you know, you can see still the yeah. dusty imprint, and there you are sobbing in the on the ground, like being like, How could this happen to me? Or are you the guy that's, you know, taking the couch in the middle of the night and walking out? A very good visual. I try. <laughs> I'll make a video about that. So it's it's both. I think both people need to be able to repeat all those things again and again. The one I just barely mentioned is more the person that gets broken up with because usually the person who initiates it at least thinks about it for weeks, maybe months mm. before they do it. But they also need people that they can talk to because a lot of times they break up for really good reasons. Like maybe they were abused or they were really hurt and they're wanting to go back to the person. They're going to need you as the friend to remind them of the reasons that they broke up because they're usually really good. And if they go back and those reasons still exist, then they'll probably just end up breaking up again and be back to where they were. Now, this is a very common thing we see on Adam's channels, and that is people who are very mad, especially with avoidant anxious dance. You know, that's yeah. like the, the core source of people breaking up. And people say this, is breaking up with somebody like murder? Is breaking up <laughs> with them like killing their soul or the personality? It can feel like it, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it can definitely feel like it. What happens most of the time, it, it can be like murder in two ways. Most of the time, what I see happen, what's happened to me and what's happened to people that I've coached and work with is to the person who got broken up with, most things seem good and normal. Like maybe they're fighting, but maybe the fighting's become the new climate of the relationship, so it just feels normal. And then all of a sudden, the person that they love disappears, and it's like they were replaced with a robot. And mm. like this person has no feelings, they're totally different. They might even like talk different, dress different. Maybe they got a new haircut. Um, and happens. and it, does, it does feel like the person you were in love with got murdered or taken away or abducted by aliens. And that can be really, really hard to deal with. And it, it makes moving on hard because people will be like really angry at this new version that broke up with them and, and feel like they can't ever move on from the old version because they're just this innocent person that didn't do anything wrong, but they can't find them anymore. And it's so much worse than that because who's the one person in the world you want to talk to about your pain? Yeah. Is that person that was closest to you or seemed closest to you? And now you can never have that conversation again because they don't care how you feel anymore. Yeah, it's terrible. Mm. It's brutal. A lot of this has to do with hurt feelings. Like breakups are difficult, yes, because of biochemistry, but there's also a huge component there that is simply hurt feelings and betrayal and all of this complexity, anger, resentment, you name it, it exists there. It is like death, but not. This is something that brains have trouble comprehending. When a person dies, you mentioned a funeral, we're able to go through a process and there's a grieving process. We have policies, we have laws, we have all of the systems supporting a actual death 
grieving process. Now, at the same time, none of this exists in the realm of breakups. There is no paperwork you fill out. There is no party that happens for you. There is sometimes. no ceremony. Well, <laughs> sometimes. Usually not in a good way. There is no ceremony that you're supposed to go through that is supposed to guide you through this process of relief that you're supposed to experience because that person is still alive. And this concept of free choice is really kind of muddling our brains. We don't understand, we cannot comprehend, we cannot calculate. Now, there is one aspect that allows for this to happen, which is the mechanism of forgiveness. Let's talk a little bit about forgiveness. What is forgiveness in the role of a breakup? So I think there's a lot of information on the internet right now about why you do not need to forgive to move on. And I, I really don't like it. Really? Yeah. What do they say? <laughs> Well, they, a lot of people say, like, it depends on the severity of what happened to you, which okay. makes sense. Like, if someone did something really bad to you, part of us can feel like, if I forgive them, that's injustice. Or I'm, I'm disrespecting myself by offering forgiveness to this person because of how bad what they did was to me. Instead, I'll hate you forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I've had people, like, message me, and it's been eight years since their breakup, and they're totally fine, except for when a song comes on that reminds them of that one ex or if someone they're dating now does a similar behavior to what that one ex did. And most of the time it's because they never went through and actually forgave the person. And that's why they're still connected to the person that they don't like. So to me, I just, I define forgiveness as letting go of pain just for yourself. And that's it. Not more complicated than that. And I think it can happen by First, like being sad, then being angry, and then you kind of have a choice to go through to forgiveness or bitterness. And to me, the people who choose bitterness at that point never fully move on. So what's the difference then between forgiveness and forgetfulness? Where you say letting go of pain, is it simply just not removing the experience as opposed to creating a new connection with a person and actually trying to create a system which allows you to actually forgive them, to say, I will now overcome this experience. So I don't, I don't think you really can forget it without forgiving. Because to me, again, with that definition I laid out earlier, forgiving is letting go of the pain. And this analogy is, my wife and I talk about this stuff like late at night, this is what we do. But um, we came up with one analogy to talk about forgiveness um, that I think will help answer this question. So for the people who don't forgive, we, we made the analogy that it's kind of like being inside of a prison and your ex is the prison guard. And they don't just stay like they were in real life. In order to justify you staying in the prison and continuing to be hurt about this, you actually tend to make them worse than they ever were in real life. You like further their character arc. So that if you were to take that like prison in your mind version of the ex and put them next to what actually happened, they would be a lot worse. And that's generally what I see happen with people who don't forgive. And by forgiving, you, you, it's not even you have to tell them. You just have to do it in your own head. But to me, people who don't forgive end up making this person worse and worse. And that gives that ex, maybe they were a terrible person. It gives them power over your life. And you can forget it most of the time. But I find that when people don't go through the forgiveness process, which is trying to understand why they did it, having compassion, learning about attachment styles and seeing what in their past may have caused them to do this and then having pity on that. People who don't go through that process generally are fine until something triggers them and puts them back in that prison and they have to live under the shadow of that worse version of their ex. Now, let me ask you this, because this is where a lot of people that come to me, they get hung up on and they don't necessarily come to me Right after a breakup, right? You're the yeah. breakup guy. They come to me when they want to build the next relationship, but they're still hung up. And they say, Adam, I don't know if I can move into another relationship because I don't think I've forgiven my ex enough. And I ask them, you know, what do you think forgiveness should feel like? And many of them get hung up on this idea that if you've forgiven someone, you feel good about them. You mm. have positive feelings toward them, that that somehow is forgiveness, that you have to release that. Same thing if they have to forgive their parents for their difficult yeah. childhood. I have to feel great about this person or else I don't forgive them. Mm. What do you think forgiveness should feel like to a person so that maybe if the people at home are asking themselves, have I forgiven somebody enough? What would they feel that would let them know they have reached a place of forgiveness? I think it's when like, you don't feel their power over you anymore. And it can be gratitude. Like that can be one definition of it is you 
I look back at, at my past relationships and I feel a lot of gratitude for what they gave me and what they turned me into. But even if you get to indifference, I think just if there's no great negative emotions coming onto you when something reminds you of them, I think that's when you know that it's good and done. And I, I don't think I don't think it has to be perfect before you get into a relationship either. The the best thing that I've heard for getting into a new relationship is that you're happy enough that you're not gonna happy enough on your own that you're not going to get into the same thing that hurt you. But not like I'm completely perfect and I'm all the way happy that I never need another person again. So are there differences in the way that men forgive and women forgive between the masculine and the feminine forgiveness? I think that usually women are faster. And the reason why I think that is because to truly forgive, I think you really have to face everything that was bad. And in my experience, what I've seen, usually women will actually face those feelings before men will. A lot of the times men will, and this is like generally speaking, there's going to be exceptions on both sides, but I think men will often distract themselves longer than women will. So I think women are a little quicker, but I think the process should be the same. Mm. What do you think, Adam? So scientifically, the research is fascinating on this. It actually shows that men fall out of love slower than women do. Mm. Women fall out of love much faster than men typically do. And there's, of course, the old stereotype that women are a bit more vindictive than men. They'll <laughs> hold on to the anger and the hurt. But, but women, funny enough, re women are much more practical creatures in their relationships than men are because biologically they've had to be. You have to move on and protect your children. Mm. The men throughout history, the ones who have procreated and had children survive were the ones that stayed stuck on their partner for much longer. Wow. So it is a biological feature that men are going to be stuck. And that's why a lot of men get pulled in for stalking and, and things like that <laughs> as well, because we can't let go. And call me. And, and exactly, exactly. There, there's, there's tons of those things. But, and funny enough, yes, I have plenty of women come to me after breakups, but it is often the guys, actually. It's interesting that you say. It's often the guys who come in and say, I'm still stuck on my ex a year later. Yeah. Very often. Yeah, I my audience is about 50-50. And I think it it's probably good for a lot of girls to hear this because I think that a lot of women have an idea that men don't like feel all these deep feelings like they do. Like they think they're alone in all of this. But yes, I can say by the people that call me and probably you too, that definitely men feel all these same feelings and this hurt. They just don't always share it as openly in public. And you know what's fascinating is a lot of women do come to me after, shortly after the breakup, right? Yeah. A month, two, three, uh, 90 day, that 90 day window, they come and say, oh, my avoidant ex, he left. What is he thinking? What is he feeling? Does he miss me? Is he going to come back? Yeah. Right. And they're thinking that. And the avoidant man is off on his own, like coping, <laughs> he's dopamine binging, he's having fun. But often when all that starts to s slow down, he does look back and say, you know, what, what drove me to jump out of that relationship? Why did I do that? Then he'll start analyzing usually much later down the road where she, where she doesn't see it at all. Has that been your experience too? One million percent. And I think I'll talk about stages now. Yeah. So there's, there's a general flow that people go through after breakups that's pretty consistent. And that what you just mentioned is called the relief stage in this model. That most of the time after someone breaks up with you, again, like we talked about earlier, they usually don't just decide that day that they're going to do it. Especially if they have avoidant attachment style, they might have been building it up in their mind for months. And that's a really uncomfortable experience. If you've ever had like a time where you weren't sure about the relationship you were in, for me, like every time I'd be in the shower, like my mind's going back and forth and it's just this horrible war that's going on all the time. And that's probably what your ex was feeling before they broke up with you. So most times after someone does it, they feel really, really relieved. And that usually manifests in going to parties, doing all these dopamine things that you talked about, posting on social media that they're having the best time of their life. Cutting your hair. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a big one. Dying your hair. I bought a Tesla. Um, <laughs> nice. Congratulations. Yeah, I, that's, I had, yeah, that's a breakup. I had it for two months. <laughs> but yeah, so doing all those things, feeling really relieved. And eventually after that, the flow usually goes to what you said. They're like, did I actually like the decision that I made? And then they'll start looking at your Instagram, wondering why you haven't reached out to them yet. And not everyone will get to the next step. The next step is sometimes people will reconsider. 
And the best studies that I've seen is about 48-ish percent of people get back together. Ooh. A lot of those re-break up again, which we can talk about later. Ooh. But, <laughs> but that's, that's what usually happens is they feel really relieved. And if you leave them alone during that period, then they can start wondering what you're doing. They can start wondering if you actually are worth reconsidering with to them. But the problem is most people don't leave them alone. Most people end up continually begging them and continually trying to get them to change their mind by convincing them logically that they're a good partner, which is not how attraction works. And Ooh. that can either keep them relieved for a longer period because they're fighting to maintain that relief because relief feels awesome, or it can drive a deeper wedge between you and hurt and destroy that future chance for reconciliation because you destroyed respect. I want to take a moment and thank everybody who's watching. It is not possible to grow a podcast without people watching, but also people commenting and supporting and helping us reach a wider audience. So thank you so much, so, so much for supporting us in all of this work and for being part of our conversation. I also want to thank the people at the Veritas Creator Academy who have helped me personally grow into creator who can go out and help everybody on the internet with attachment. If you're a creator who's wanting to grow, who's wanting to monetize, and who's wanting to get your message out there to improve the world, check out the Veritas Creator Academy people because I know they can help you the way they've helped me. The Veritas Creator Academy, that is our specialty. We take creators who are able to go and change the world and try to make money online and help them turn into proper brands with seven figures revenue and more and to help them grow into their actual full selves. Just like what we've done with Adam, we're doing with many others and we'd love to help you do the same. And for now, let's get back to the episode and uh, figure out what's up. So how many breakups actually have a chance to get together and stay together happily for the rest of their life? Because many people assume you're done once, it's over. You don't have yeah. no chance. I very much disagree with that. So really, yeah. There's two. There's two major camps within the breakup world of of Instagram and TikTok, <laughs> which is there's there's one where an ex is an ex for a reason. You should never go back to anyone under any circumstances, and I don't think that is in line with reality. Because if you ask three friends for sure one of them will know someone who broke up and then got together again and then had kids and they're like are you saying that those kids should not exist no you wouldn't say that the other team is everyone comes back always and those ones get a lot more views because people want to see that and they can't really be caught on their bs because they could say that they just haven't come back yet they're going to come back in 20 years <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the one i like the least my place that I try to stay is in the middle because I, I do think that most relationships that break up should be broken up. I think that most people break up for valid reasons. At the same time, I think that a lot of people have communication errors. A lot of people have life circumstances like death of a, a family member or just depression or something logistical that you're going through in your life that can prematurely end relationships. And those ones, I think, can be saved and you can get back together. The key is that something has to change in one or both partners so that you're not just recreating the same relationship that just ended. A lot of people try to get back together, and they, they do, and it's been like two weeks, and they're like, okay, we'll be so different now, and they're not, and mm -hmm. then they break up again two weeks later, and they call me again, and <laughs> like, so that, that's what I look for for the ones that work is have you made significant changes to yourself, has your ex made significant changes to their, themselves? Have you guys had enough time that those changes are actually possible? And have you had enough time that you could actually miss each other and see what life is like without each other so you could make a clear and logical decision on if it's better to be together? So this is going to be an interesting question awesome. because a lot of our listeners are religious, yeah. various branches of Christianity, um, Judaism, you know, Islam, all of those. And all of those religions are very specific about divorce, yeah. right? So in many cases, they say divorce is prohibited. What are your views on divorce? That's a good question. I, this is another one of my wife's conversations yesterday. <laughs> Can you talk about divorce? Yeah, we did. We actually are both divorced before we met each other. Gotcha. So both of us got married really early 20s. I was 20, she was 22. And then we were both married for about two and a half years. This is to other people. And then we got divorced. 
and then we found each other and got married. So growing up, my I did not have any divorce in my immediate family. So my view on divorce growing up was people who get divorced are quitters. <laughs> it's, it's not good. They're just giving up. They're not working through what they should work through. And then all of a sudden, like we were fighting and things, but one day my wife came home and said we were getting divorced. And I tried begging for like three days. I did every single thing that the movies tell you you should do. I got her like a ton of flowers. I cried. I came up with lists of reasons we could do it. I told her that I would sacrifice all of my dreams to make sure that we could be married. She wanted to move back um, to the state that she was from. And I was like, I'll quit. I was applying to medical school at the time. I was like, I'll quit medical school. I'll go work at McDonald's where you want to live. Like I will do every single thing possible to stay married. And it didn't work. And we got divorced. So then my logic about divorce was broken because I didn't feel like I was a quitter. Like I, I put more effort in than I ever had at the end. And it still ended. So my view on divorce now is I really do believe that marriage is a promise and a lifetime commitment. With, and that covers things like falling out of love. To me, I do not see that as a reason to get divorced. Mm. I like the definition that love is a verb and that you should do the things to continue falling in love with your partner. And I know that there's some things that cause that not to be possible. Like there are things like abuse and there are things like infidelity that I think, and just if one partner quits, mm -hmm. there's not really anything you can do about it. So infidelity, let's dig into this. Okay. Do you believe that if there is cheating, full on sexual cheating, like an actual affair, that must be the end of that relationship? No. Really? Mm -mm. So in what cases can one partner forgive each, uh, the other partner for having a full on affair? I think if there's extreme accountability and willingness to meet the requirements that the innocent party is asking for. So okay. what that would look like is if, if there's cheating and then the person who was cheated on is like, I need to see your phone all the time now. I need to take away some of your privacy. I think that's okay. And I think that you need to be able to be humble enough to realize that you really hurt that person and now these are the things they need to build up trust in you again. And you need to be willing to do those things. I don't blame people who get divorced over infidelity. I, I do think it's a legitimate reason. And I think a lot of times the accountability is the issue. It's really hard to do. But I, I've seen marriages get saved and come back together when one person really is feeling bad enough and taking enough accountability and humble enough to do what the other person needs to feel trust again. Okay. Adam, so you are a former family therapist, you're an attachment specialist, you deal with divorce all the time. Mm -hmm. Can you actually come back from actual full-on intentional cheating? Of course. Really? Of course. I have so many guys come into me and they, interestingly, they often tag in their wife into the email exchange and they come into me and say, Adam, I have uh, been cheating on my wife. I am absolutely broken that I have done this. My wife is also broken. We're headed toward divorce and I want to figure out how to fix this, but is there a way to come back from it? And the wife is like silently watching in the email exchange. <laughs> and I tell them there's a reason that this affair happened. There was a reason that this was able to happen. The, the secrets you have kept it almost always, I, I've never seen an affair happen in the absence of attachment issues. It's always present with attachment, whether it's anxious attachment, avoidant attachment, often disorganized attachment. It's always present there. So the only way, the only one and only pathway to really healing a marriage after an affair is for you to fully and transparently change your attachment style and become secure and have all the secure behaviors worth transparency, chasing your principles, chasing your goals and being fully known by your partner. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to leave, live in a police state for the rest of your life. What it means is you need to foster the sort of character that it is impossible for you to be cheating because you are self-motivating on your transparency, self-motivating on your principles. You need to be the kind of person who would never cheat again, and they have to be able to believe that. And if you can create that, not only does your marriage heal, but you yourself become the person you've always wanted to be, and their trust for you will grow bigger than it ever was before. So your marriage can flourish at that point. What do you think about that quote? Does that make sense? I completely agree. Interesting. <laughs> a lot of 
men out there are very principled, right? They say, if you cheat on me once, I can never trust you again. Mm. And in many ways, I find myself in that camp. Right? I really do. So what is it really that uh, will enable somebody to forgive the unforgivable? Like, is What is the mechanism there that allows for men to pass on that principle? Because to me, that sounds like a principle, right? And why should I pass on that principle? Why would I pass on that principle? Under, under what circumstances would I ever change my mind? I think you have to actually believe that people are capable of true character change at their core. If lacking that, there's really no coming back from an affair. But if you have that capacity to truly believe that a person can transform to that degree, then at least it opens the door. I'm not saying that every single case is simply going to be a hand wave gesture of, okay, I forgive you. Mm-hmm. But that fundamental belief then opens the door to ask the question of how can you tell when someone has really transformed who they are? What do you see when someone has really been resurrected from those ashes? What what does it look like? And and how could you prove, really prove that someone had that that Saul to Paul transformation, so to speak? Mm-hmm. How can you verify that? What are your thoughts on that? My first thought is I wanted to bring up that I don't think you're a bad person if you can't get there. Mm-hmm. Everyone wants to believe that people can change. And I, I think that it's like, this is like the goal. And I, I do think it is. But if you're really hurt about it, I don't think you're a bad person if it ends because of that. So that's the first thing I wanted to bring up. For how to see the change, that was the question, right? How to yeah. see the change. I think you'll be able to feel it. I don't think it's going to be super intellectual. I think that over time as, again, like they do what they say they will do and what you're requiring, whether that's like couples therapy or again, like maybe getting rid of some privacy or doing things without you asking to become closer and build a relationship. I think you're going to start feeling less pressure that it feels forced and it's going to start feeling like the relationship did before the cheating happened. So to me, seeing that the other person has changed is something that you'll feel. And I, and I like that, the feeling, the sense of it. You'll know it when you see it. Let me run this by you and get your thoughts on this. One thing I teach to people when they come into my coaching practice is the four levels of trust. And those four levels run like this. The first level is that you must be consistent, but also self-correcting with your own principles, where when you make a mistake, it bothers you. You have to fix it. So you'll go to the other person and say, I made this mistake. Here's what I'm going to do to actually correct it. And when you when and you have to be consistent with that, especially during stress. Proving that you are going to be consistent with those principles during stress times is actually one key feature. Instead of, hey, when I, you know, when I'm stressed out, I'll shift over to this. But I'll come back to this and compensate you for having broken my principles. That's what a lot of people that, that when they have affairs, that's what they have done is they have hidden their their infractions, their brokenness from that. They they step away during times of stress and reason and and rationalize it to themselves the second piece though is a long-term goal and that long-term goal has to be something that is incompatible with cheating right your principles and your long-term goals have to be completely antithetical to cheating in the future and then you have to be self-correcting back to them all the time and you have to be consumed by them and really driven by them so that not only would you not cheat because your partner could catch you again but you would never cheat because it would destroy you as a person and everything you're hoping to build what do you think I think about, I learned one time about morality that there's different levels. And one of them is things are only wrong if someone knows that I'm doing them wrong. And that's what my dog does. My dog like really likes chewing up shoes and will do it unless somebody's watching. If somebody's watching, then she won't do it. She'll like act like she's really, really good. But if no one's watching, then all of the shoes will be destroyed. And that's, that's what I was thinking of when you said that, that I think if your partner is like that, you're not going to trust them. I'm not going to trust my dog with deeper things because I can see that the level of her morality is not at the point where she's doing things for those purpose of those like inner goals, like you were saying. So yeah, I think that trust, I think that you need to have that to have trust. And it's something that you can see through daily actions. You can see by how they react when they do mess up. Are they genuinely sorry? And 
yeah, I think you, that's just something you need to see over time. So to that, I'm glad you brought up that morality scale because those that research and those surveys, they showed that only about 10% of people ever really reached the level of morality of, I will do X because it is right. Really? 80% of people in the middle have have levels two to, to five of varying degrees of, I will do this because society says it's right. I will do this because I can get away with it. I will do this because people will think positively. All, all the way down to, I will legalism i will do yeah. what i can get away with yeah. and the bottom 10 percent is i'll do what i want yeah. regardless of consequences but it's only that top 10 percent that can really say this is right and i will do it no matter what so that makes sense why most couples struggle to come back from affairs because for the person to really transform to your point for them to really transform they'd have to be in that 10 percent camp or become that 10 percent camp Right, but it's still 10%. And this is actually a big thing that gives birth to movements like Red Pill, to yeah. like MGTOW, like all of these outcomes where we say, you know what? The probability that you are going to divorce me is 90%, given the chance. You know, given the chance. If, you know, insert uh, celebrity here, I don't know, like if this person was standing there outside the door with a door open to the Lamborghini and a trillion dollars and that thing that you always wanted, you would walk out on me. And that probability is 90%. So why should I ever fully commit and trust is I think a major fuel behind those movements. Now what you guys are basically saying is you should, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying you should not only have the capacity to forgive somebody who has done that with less than a trillion dollars, most likely. But you should be willing to play that game again and again and again forever. That your probability of finding somebody who will never leave you is 10%. And that means you should have, you know, expect at least 10 relationships, nine out of which we will, will leave you. How do you guys give somebody hope as practicing coaches to come back to that dating pool and try again over and over and over again, knowing that the odds are 9 out of 10 not in their favor. Well, wait a minute. The odds aren't just 9 out of 10. You're going to have to go through 10 to find the 1, right? That that itself is the fallacy because people always love to say, oh, 50% of marriage is in a divorce. Yep. So every marriage is a random coit toss, and that's absolutely wrong, right? There are some marriages that enter in with a tiny sliver of risk, and there's some marriages that enter in probably with 99% likelihood of divorce. It's, it's so many variables that are at play to try to really gauge that. Let's just disassemble that. Okay, so yes, 100%, and I'm kind of pitching you a fallacy because that's a common fallacy that is on the internet. Of that course. is literally yeah. what they say, both the 9 out of 10 and the 50% of marriages, which already kind of don't coincide. Mm. But let's disassemble this, right? Obviously, if you are doing a random pool of if I walk out on the street, I close my eyes and I grab the first woman or you know, whoever the hell is passing by and I marry them, then probably that's not going to work. But now there is the selective and this learning feature where we're adjusting and we're learning or processing, which is one of the big things that you teach, Cole, is that the fact that you go through a divorce or breakup, it's an experience you're actually conditioning yourself to select better. You're shrinking the pool. You're cutting out that kind of bottom and mid funnels where people are not for you, right? So how is that supposed to work? How can you take divorce, breakups, heartbreak, and turn this into a benefit? So I think first about the sunk cost bias. That's Ooh. what really helped me. So sunk cost bias for people who don't know is a lot of times if we feel like we've already put a lot of effort or money or whatever into something, we either feel like we have to do everything we can to save it or we become really bitter that it was taken away from us. And to me, this really rang true with applying to medical school. Like I, I did a lot of things. I went to school for four years. I graduated. I did really good on the MCAT. I was a teacher for at the college for two semesters. I started this nonprofit and I applied to all these schools and I didn't get in. And there's two ways I could think about that. There's a way I could think of it that I get really bitter and don't like doctors anymore. Or I could think I learned how to learn. I learned how to view myself as intelligent. I met amazing people. I started doing this breakup thing because I wanted to make money for medical school. And everything I have in my life is because of that decision. And for me, that's how you can turn a divorce into something that helps you is, well, one way. You can look at everything you put in and then try to focus on the things that you actually got out of it, which is the opposite of what most people do. Most people think about what hurt them because 
that's another bias, negativity bias. We're trying to protect ourselves from that happening in the future. But it keeps you from taking the gems that you actually got from the experience. So the first thing is just focusing and enumerating the things you actually got from it. The second is accountability and really identifying and being humble with why you were wrong. I was very, very critical of my ex-wife and I was pretty manipulative and controlling when I got anxious. And because I can realize that, I can have the power to change it. And I can look online. There's a million resources with his stuff he puts out, with books, books like Attached and Secure Love are some of my favorites right now. But if you can identify what you did wrong, then you can grow. And that to me is how you end up picking better people. I don't think it's always walking around blind and picking like someone <laughs> random. I think the people who heal and are healthy have like a nine out of 10 chance of choosing the right person. Yeah, but it's the art of saying no. Sorry, Adam, yeah. go ahead. And, and this is, this is so true. So something I've never really talked much about, right? I, I have my wife, we have a wonderful marriage. We've been married for 15 years. We have five children, right? Like it is a great marriage, but she was actually the seventh person that I dated. Yeah. Right? I was an idiot when i started dating when i was younger i started dating when i was about 13 14 started dating girls that's really that's awesome oh, yeah. and well <laughs> it's, it, it, it was what it was and and i was a complete moron i had no idea what i wanted everything was feelings everything was you know can i make you happy can you make me happy and i was the first person that my wife ever dated she was very careful and very practical she hadn't she didn't actually plan to get in a romantic relationship unless it was a perfect match with values religious faith everything she was enormously careful so by the time i found her it, I, it had taken me all those iterations until i was 23 years old 22 years old i was 22 years old dating all these other people, pain, 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 pain. <laughs> oh, that was wrong. That was stupid. That was dumb. Okay, wait a minute. And then I found that criteria that she had already understood. Yeah, it's interesting how women tend to understand these things much more innately and much deeper. Like boys and men need to run into things face first repeatedly, is my experience. <laughs> I, I learn too. with my face. Yeah. If I don't run into it and if it doesn't hurt, I am going to run into it to find out. <laughs> right. And it's something that's been predominant throughout my entire life is learning through this experience at a blatant disregard for my own self. And by consequence, unfortunately, has been with for disregard for others as well. Like I am going to take responsibility for saying uh, for that and say that I've been a client of Adams in the coaching practice for many years. Like he's helped me through my divorce and it's been a complete shit show. Right. And he's seen me go through a complete shit show and be a complete shit show. So it is interesting to see how those experiences work out. But really, a lot of it also has to do with the learning part and the forgiveness part. It is the art of saying no. Forgiveness isn't just something you do for the other person. Forgiveness is also something you have to do for yourself. So you've gone through something. You've given yourself criticism. You said, oh, I was manipulative. I was you know, acting not in a way that was in line with my values. You've just done the same thing, Adam. You said, I was you know, being an idiot. So <laughs> at what point and how did you guys go through the forgiveness process for yourself? That was harder. Ah, so I don't know why I do this, but my personality is I viewed the people that I dated as these perfect angels that I came in and corrupted and destroyed. That was, that was my view of my relationship. So the accountability, I'm sure they would agree. <laughs> they would actually, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that was, that was my mindset at the beginning, which I do think is actually easier to move forward and get better with that mindset than the one that nothing was my fault. But I think you have a lot more pain and you eventually do get stuck too. So the thing that really helped me was I was in therapy one time and we were talking about forgiving myself and I was saying all the specific instances where I was a jerk and what I said and what I did and how it made her feel. And my therapist told me a story and, and related. So the story is there's a store owner and he like... I think he sold lemons, we'll say. He sells lemons and a, a kid comes by and steals a lemon and then runs off. And he never sees the kid again. So the store owner... Who would steal a lemon? Why would you steal a lemon? <laughs> <laughs> Let's make them um, gold bars then. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> okay, so the kid comes by and steals a gold bar. And um, the, the store owner, every single time he sees a gold bar for the rest of his life, he thinks of that kid and is really, really angry and just hates gold bars for the rest of time. It's, it's weirder with this example, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he does. And he feels pain like that every single time. 
And then in the second example, if the store owner chooses to forgive the kid, again, he never sees the kid. The kid never returns the gold bar, but he's free. And what she told me is that forgiveness is a free gift. It's a gift that does not have to be earned. The other person does not have to do anything to deserve it. The other person doesn't have to repay what they did wrong to you to deserve it. And it's the exact same thing for you. So if you think about yourself and you think about something that you did in the past that's really terrible, you can't jump in a time machine and fix it. It's impossible. So the choice either is to give that free gift to yourself, and it really is. You need to ponder on that idea and actually believe it for this to work. But the choice is either to give the free gift or continue punishing yourself forever because you cannot fix it. You, mm. can, you can do everything you can. You can say sorry. You can, you can repay what you did in that way. But you can't all the way fix something that you broke. So it has to be a free gift that you give to yourself the same way it did to others. And that really helped me get past it. I like that. Adam, self-forgiveness. You know, you know this very deeply and very intimately through your scientific research and your practice and all of the, uh, all of the experience you've had. You've been in psychology for 15 years, right? Mm -hmm. So forgiveness of self what exactly is it and how does that work? You know, I hate this idea that um, we have to love ourselves before anyone else can love us. And we hear that in our society all the time. Self-love, love yourself. No one else can if you don't. And it is the opposite of how humans are supposed to function. It's the opposite of how our biochemistry runs. It's the opposite of how we learn as children to, to be loved. Kids don't pop out loving themselves, right? None of my kids were born loving themselves. They can be selfish and self-focused for their own interests, but that doesn't mean they love themselves. They don't really have a concept of that. Children learn, am I worthy of love based on the love that they are given, right? Or... They learn that other people are incapable of love, so the idea of love itself becomes moot. Either I'm not worthy or love itself doesn't exist. Those are the two outcomes with broken attachment, right? Secure attachment, they learn I am worthy of love. So I look at the idea of self-forgiveness, and I think it starts with self-respect. I think it also starts with being accepted and loved by other people that you then also respect. It goes back to the principles. It goes back to the goals, right? So let's take you and me, for example, Andre. Let's imagine that, uh, let's imagine I don't really like myself. I'm not a good person. I, I have a, a girlfriend for some reason when we break up and uh, I, I go through this experience and I say, well, nobody loves me and it's because I don't deserve to be loved. You might come to me and say, well, no, it's not that nobody loves you. It's that we don't trust you. We don't know you. We don't, we don't, we can't predict what you're going to do. And so I come to you and I say, well, I want to be a man who is worthy of respect and, and trust. So you give me a list of things that would change, right? Be consistent. Stop trying to please people. Start being who you are and then follow that so people can understand you. And then they can start to trust your behavior patterns instead of you giving into fear and feelings, right? And, and this is an important piece. And once I've done that, I can come to you again and say, okay, I've done this. Do I deserve your respect? And you might say, Yes, you do. Measurably, yes, you do. And I also care about you and I like you. And in fact, I love you. And then I can learn in that moment, I am worthy of the love and respect of a person that I respect. That's really where self-love and self-forgiveness, I think, begins. Humans are not meant to live in isolation. Mm -hmm. We aren't also meant to forgive ourselves in isolation. We're not mm -hmm. meant to love ourselves in isolation. We aren't meant to respect ourselves in isolation. It is in relational living that I believe we find respect, love, and even forgiveness. It's amazing. Well, respect is a combination of authenticity, intent, and action, right? So authenticity, meaning that you are saying what you are, right? You're not lying to me. You're not lying to yourself. You're not deceiving, right? Intent is I intend, you intend to be what you are saying you are, and action is you're actually going out and doing it. So forgiveness itself actually is a combination of all of those. That is the action towards respect because you are forgiving as an action, you're forgiving as an intent, and you're forgiving as, uh, a, as a characteristic of yourself. Like you're actually fostering the ability to be authentic in that forgiveness. Um, 
a lot of religions again play in this like the idea of forgiveness of redemption of resurrection are foundational to christianity to well i'm not as familiar with judaism and islam but I, as i understand they're pretty critical there as well and literally every philosophy buddhism Right, Taoism, the idea of letting go and allowing the regeneration and rejuvenation of the mind, and the, the fact that our life is not a continual, right? It is something that is cycles. Death and rebirth are a constant narrative that we exist, and we actually allow for that. For some reason, that is not something that is we, that, that we grant to relationships. For some reason, we think that relationships is going to be the way that they have been on day one when you, you know, Kissed for the first time is the way it's going to be forever. Now, yes, the death of a relationship, the breakup is the extreme version. But when it comes to actual relationships that continue, and you know, you are now married, as I understand, Cole. I know you're married and been oh, yeah. for a long time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, what is the role of mini breakups? Not breakups, but disconnects and reconnects, rejuvenations in a successful relationship. I think if you do them right, they make you a lot stronger than you would if you never went through them. One, one of the things I notice a lot is a lot of people who call me, probably most, say that we never fought. Mm. And they, they say that, and then they're so shocked that they broke up. And I, I usually have to explain to them that they just didn't know what the other person wanted because a lot of times the other person didn't tell them that. So to me, like fighting's hard and like it's it's really hard for me when i fight in a in my marriage now because i'm trying my best not to be this person i was in the past and when i see little glimpses of that come back it can make me feel really terrible it you out, eh? yeah yeah so it, it does take like humility it takes forgiving yourself it takes putting the same expectations on yourself as you put on other people but to me when me and jocelyn's my wife's name when jocelyn and i are able to fight and then come back together by usually taking some time apart and and thinking about the other person we're in, we end up a lot stronger than we would have been i think if we never would have had a mini breakup or a fight mm. i don't do you have many many breakups with your wife <laughs> when we were young we used to fight we, we haven't fought in years and years and years. You now, have too I, many children. You have no time. Well, there's that. you got to unite against the kids. <laughs> no, but, but, you know, we've, we've reached a place where if there's a frustration, then yeah. we, we have a conversation about it. If there's a bad day, we have a conversation about it. We've reached a place where we've, we've, we, we had so many challenges and so many disagreements and so many things that we've reached a place now through all of those. We've grown through all of them where we now have a very clear vision of our goals. And if there's a deviation from those goals, we have a conversation about it. Mm. It doesn't mean it's always perfect, but we have a conversation about that goal. And we both know that we are unified around those goals so we can remind each other back to those self-correcting views. But it, I, thank goodness we haven't had a fight in quite a long time. That's cool. And hopefully we don't for a long time. But, you know, if and when we do, it's a chance to test those, those commitments again. Mm. It's a chance to test if we both really mean what we say around the goal of building our family. It's a chance to test if, we, if, if what we said about our principles is really true. It's a recommitment and a reconfirmation of those things, or it's a revelation that they were fake. Interesting. And this reconfirmation is something that you must always keep in mind and always test yourself so you don't have to fight. Like if you, if you do your homework, if you clean out your brain your soul your body every day or every week you know that's why there's a lot of things that happen on weekly cycles in terms of good habits good practices good meditations you know whatever they're supposed to be rejuvenating so that you don't have to get to the breaking point um, so that you can retest and sometimes you must accept that you've made a mistake and uh, sometimes that mistake is irreparable so cole here's a question to you how do you know that you should break up Ooh. That's a good question. So first, I, I do think it matters what other people around you are saying. That a lot of times people come to me and like their whole entire family and all of their friends are telling them this person's bad and they won't leave. So I do think you should take that into account. That sometimes emotions are going to make it so you can't see everything super clearly. Not to say you should let them make your decisions, but it should be in your decision making process. That's the first thing. Second is, I think that there's certain things that I think are pretty much 
almost always valid reasons to break up. And that is if you have completely different goals for the future. Like if you guys got together and one of you wants kids, the other one doesn't. Or religion can be one. Or even for people who are very into like politics. If you have different politics, mm -hmm. that can be one. So different values that compete. I think, I think those are reasons to break up. Another thing is if there's something that you've brought up several, several times and you need to make sure you actually did bring it up and the other person understood it, which is another complexity to it because you can think you brought it up and the other person doesn't really know it because it wasn't communicated as well as it could have been. But if you've brought up this thing and it just will not change, you haven't seen any accountability, you haven't seen any change, then those are the reasons I think that are valid to break what up. What something small, you know? there's one couple I knew and used to fight about one thing for years. It was the fact that the guy did not fully close drawers. You know, they were just a little bit open like this. Yeah. And she was like, are you a psychopath? <laughs> like, are you insane? Why can't you just push it all? And you just never did. Yeah. That was the only thing they fought about. You know, they, they had a good relationship otherwise. They're still together, you know, bless their soul. But is that, you know, he just didn't do it ever. Yeah. So that's, I mentioned secure love before. That's what this book is about, a lot of it, is that a lot of times those problems are not actually the problem. And what she would say in secure love, or at least what I think she would say, is that it's not actually that he's not shutting the drawer that's the problem. It's that he is not showing that he cares about what's important to her. So she brings it up several, several times. He doesn't do it, so she's feeling unheard and unseen. And I think that's the real problem behind it and probably why they fight so often but if everything else is fine it's a minor thing should she just not let it go and they they have let it go she just gave up at one point she just said forget it i'm if you're not gonna change i'm gonna change i love you <laughs> this is great i'm just gonna give up on the drawers and and that's how they resolve that he kind of just basically just you know he won that round shall we call it that <laughs> and they were fine they were both fine with winning letting somebody else win that round but are you saying that maybe she shouldn't have done that? Should that have been escalated into a much bigger issue? Are they potentially aligning themselves, themselves up for a bigger problem in maybe 10 years? I think that if, if it's working, it's good. So to, yeah, <laughs> if it's broken, don't mess with <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I think if it's working, it's good. I think, I, I, do, I do think that that's probably what it is, that she's, it's more than the drawers to her. Mm. But I do think marriage is give and take and you can work with things like that. Well, to that point, as a man who's been married for 15 years, um, you do have things that your partner does and you do things that your partner mm -hmm. doesn't like as well. Everybody does. The difference there is with the drawers, right? You need to sit down and have a conversation about that. Do you not care about the things that bother me? Or is there something maybe weird about your brain? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, have, you have ADHD pretty bad and, and you're, you're always halfway distracted. So you never notice the drawers. And every time I try to remind you, like it, you, it doesn't even track. It's because it doesn't pass the two sensor test. So basically we have, you know, senses. And uh, for a man to notice and do something about something, it has to trigger two or more senses at the same time. We do not take the garbage out because it's full. We take it out because it's full and it smells. Yeah. Like we do not take, uh, you know, we do not move an object uh, until we trip over it and see it. Like if we just see it, we don't move it. And if we trip over it, don't see it, we don't do anything about it. Like it has to be two senses at the same time or more need to be triggered. And so in my marriage, I'll, I'll share a little bit about that. It's garbage. Exactly. I, I will never, ever, ever remember to take the garbage out. Really? Unless if it I walk by it, right? The question is, why don't you see it? It's right there. Well, women will track everything in their environment and notice men don't. I'm thinking about work. I'm thinking about the kids. I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about that. I'll walk right by it. But if it's smelly, if I trip over it, yes. So <laughs> my, ideally all three, but my, Smelly, you trip over so our, it and you my, see it. My thing to her was, look, me taking, not taking the trash out is not because I don't love you. Tell me, Adam, take the trash out. And I immediately will take the trash out because that's my care for you, as I will care for that. Her thing is, and, and many women do this, right? Everything becomes an area to spread crafts or information or paperwork. Everything in the world is a table because she's always thinking. Her brain is always going and she's jumping task, this task, that task. So everything becomes a table in the home, right? So- 
I, I, we, we have we have corralled that as well. She has specific areas that are designated for her tasks, for her ongoing files, for her ongoing this and that. Those areas can be covered in paperwork or, or whatever else it may be, half, half finished stuffed animals or whatever she's repairing. Those areas are covered in that. The other areas are nice and clean. And it's not that she doesn't love me. It's that that's how her brain works. We have accommodated how our brains work. But we did have those conversations. Is it that you don't care? Or is it that this is really a limitation? And when we could accept each other and say, okay, this really is a limitation. <laughs> okay, then we could move forward without those hurt feelings, without mm -hmm. fighting over drawers. Yeah. Okay. And I think there's one more example I can think of. It was on a podcast recently with the Gottmans that they've written, like some of the best books on relationships there are. They, she was talking about how he will get reading these books and she'll try to talk to him and he's so focused that he will not look up from his book and he can't hear her. And for a while, it really hurt her feelings, kind of like the drawer that she would be talking and he wouldn't be like validating her by listening. So she feels like I don't matter. But they did talk about it and she found out that he grew up in a very loud environment that he had to mm. physically learn how to concentrate so hard just to think. And he still got that. So because they had that conversation, they learned what the actual truth was. And so I don't think it's terrible that they figured out the doors that way. Right. It's yeah. a communication thing. I tell this to my daughter all the time because she's, you know, she runs up to me, she's to show me something. I'm doing the dishes or I'm working and she gets mad. I go, Ellie, I'm a man. I can only think about one thing at a time. <laughs> you know, I cannot change. I cannot approve it. I can try, but you're going to have to work with me on this one. I cannot do what you can do as a six-year-old, as a 33-year-old. It is just <laughs> what it is. <laughs> so, and it's interesting because when I explain it that way, as a six-year-old, she just, she just goes, literally, really? cool. You know, like some people like blue and you just can't think. Like, cool. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, it's, it is what it is, that openness of communication, the acceptance for sure is a core thing. But, you know, that aside, what are some signs that you should break up, Adam? What are, when not being, should you leave? Not being able to have those conversations. If you can't sit down with your partner and say, hey, look, I've noticed this thing. It really bothers me. I want to figure out if it's because you don't love me. Or if it's because you're weird. <laughs> All right? If you can't, if you can sit down with a partner and they're like, Fair question. Let's talk about if I'm weird or if I don't love you. <laughs> and you can have a productive conversation about that. Odds are very good that you have a good relationship. Mm. Now, if you can't sit down with them because you're terrified, because you can't have conflict, then you're probably the bad partner, quote unquote. You're probably the, the, the problem in this relationship. Or if your partner is going to run away and dive roll out the window to try to get away from that conversation, or if they're going to get angry or defensive, if they if they care more about their own feelings than they do about your feelings. I don't care if you're hurting. This is how I feel right now. And they come back at you defensively. Then, yeah, you probably should either get some help with communication or break up at that point because you will be headed for a breakup one way or another. That's a huge sign of just being able to have those conversations. What are your thoughts on that? I completely agree. I think that relationships continually have to be growing like that. And for a time, I think one person can carry it. I think that they can get through things. But if that's the consistent problem in your relationship, I, I do think you can be much happier in one that's more balanced. Or learn some skills. Mm -hmm. and improve yourself, fix your attachment, whatever it's going to take. I, I, I've seen people turn bad relationships into great relationships. But again, you have to be willing to do that and yeah. have those hard conversations. A complete pivot. And this is something that Adam and I argue about frequently. Cool. And I'd love to hear, you know, your way in on this and maybe you can, <laughs> you can, <laughs> you can help us sides. settle this, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Um, prenups. Do you believe that prenups help or hurt relationships? So I have not had experience with one because getting married, I did not have very much money at all. Mm. <laughs> that was another <laughs> to divide. <laughs> yeah. But I think I can see both sides on this one because I do think that some people are going to have a very hard time trusting someone if they have a lot to lose. And that might be because things they went through in the past that caused them to experience getting taken advantage of so i can see where they're coming from but at the same time to me marriage is giving all of yourself to someone else and that includes everything you've amassed materially so my personal idea is i do not like them mm. because i think that it's making the promise kind of conditional but i understand that i don't understand where those i've never been in that position either
Real quick, let me take a moment to thank the sponsor of this podcast, who also has helped shape me into the creator that I am. And who better to tell you about the Veritas Creator Academy than my friend and co-host and CEO of Veritas, Andre Korakoff. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate you and I appreciate every single one of you watching this episode right now. The Creator Academy is an academy for content creators who are looking to get to seven figures, eight figures in yearly revenue. That's people who have a message, who have an audience they're trying to speak to, anybody who is trying to change the world and they're trying to do so by going online, by making content, by selling services and goods. And what we do is we help them turn into brands that are going to be around for a long time and in impact millions of people as we've done with many other content creators. Uh, I take pride in helping people become their best selves and influence the world in a way that they feel is meaningful, in a way that helps them become better and help us all become more human. Come visit the Veritas Creator Academy at veritascreative.media. What do you think about the idea that if you guys don't define a prenup for yourself, then the state is defining a prenup for you? Can you explain that idea? Yeah, so we have laws on the books about what your prenup is going to be if you guys do choose to split up. And it's really only defined by the termination of the relationship. So if you guys don't sit down and discuss what would happen in the relationship, if you don't build the marriage contract, then the state has a marriage contract for you. You're just going to have to fight it out in state and, and in the in the court system over who's going to get what. But it's, it's pretty well defined. It's pretty well laid out. Divorces is, is a massive, massive state kind of system yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, my encouragement for most couples is sit down and do a prenup, not only that talks about if we get divorced, what happens, but what's going to happen in the relationship? How are you going to build the relationship together? What are the mm. roles? What are the expectations? What are the things you're bringing in? And then how can you grow? How will you handle disputes, right? We both agree at the beginning when it's wonderful that if things go poorly, we will find a third party mediator. Who could that third party mediator be? Define that role. And yes, if things have to end, define that too, because then you can point to this contract both of you built together. And then say, this is how we need to handle things. And maybe that can help you back off. That's and my thought. The reason I really don't like that idea is that that itself, I believe, is going to damage and tarnish your relationship that you're trying to build. Because first of all, you will not be able to avoid a power struggle at that point in time. You're preemptively having your divorce. You know, by, by coming up with a prenup, you are preemptively having a divorce. And you're putting that into the universe, you know, you're manifesting, whatever, right? But you're also saying, if things don't go so well, here is what I'm going to do to you. And that is how it's going to be conveyed by a person with less power. Power dynamics are very important in those conversations. In fact, having gone through the divorce myself, right, we had a little thing I had to sign about power dynamics. And power dynamics had everything to do with how my relationship played out with my ex-wife thereafter, with how it impacted my kid. You know, it, it really did have everything to do with it. So when you go in and you propose a prenup, you're already having that power dynamic. One of you is going to be trying to dominate the other, especially if there's a money thing, right? The whole point of the state having a say is that you actually say, you know what? We both will give up all of our power and give it to a third party and let them manage us. Now, I completely understand the whole issue with it going on between different states and different laws and whatnot, but the act of giving up the control, like of putting down the gun and giving it to somebody else, is one of the biggest signs of trust that I find can occur in a relationship. I actually don't disagree on that. I, I don't think that the prenup discussion should be one where you're aiming guns at each other. I don't think that it should be. And if it's going to be, then I think that that relationship itself would be revealed through the form of building the prenup. This isn't going to work because we can't even have a reasonable conversation with each other without it turning into a nasty, hideous power struggle like that. I think that itself is a fantastic test. I think that the couples who would break up by building their prenup probably should break up because it's doomed. But is it? But really, like, why, why would be... Why would it be doomed if you have to sit down in front of your wife and or your wife to be or and say, "Hey, um, honey, 
let's talk about what's going to happen if we divorce. I have $10 million and you have 20,000 bucks in the bank. So I think I'll be taking all of mine because it's not really fair for you to go and get some of that cash before you invest. Um, now let's say if we do have a house, I think we should split it halfway because it's fair. And then I think that uh, if we do have kids, we should keep 50-50 custody. Right, because then I feel like I'm doing making a fair contribution. And as soon as you use the term fair contribution, you're playing in the red pill territory because that's one term they use all the time. I'm not going to put in more than you put in. And now it's a question of measurement. And uh, I, I have quite a lot of um, hesitation in, con uh, in measuring the female contribution to a relationship that has children especially versus a monetary contribution because, I don't know, I don't have the capacity of growing a human being. I don't understand what any of that is or is like. I don't understand the value of it. And you cannot value a child. Like if you give a child into a marriage, right, and then you're trying to quantify that, that to me is kind of gross. Just conceptually, it's gross doesn't feel right. I didn't think I'd ever hear you arguing that a marriage should be based on feelings like that. Oh, well, congratulations. Are you proud? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I am or not. Um, <laughs> so the idea that a, a marriage contract itself is going to destroy or damage the marriage itself is an interesting idea. I'm thinking of the ancient Jewish practice that is still practiced today that the couple sits down and builds their marriage contract and then beautifies it and has it displayed in their bedroom chamber so that they can have that that contract together it, never it, knew about that custom no it's, it's a, <laughs> and it's a fascinating custom but but marriage contracts it's nothing new right building a prenup where you're trying to essentially guard yourself against the other person at every aspect and get every dollar that you possibly can that itself is a little bit different but the idea of building a contract and agreement together is nothing new at all. Mm. Again, arguably, the state has that for you. So if you choose not to, the state has their third party piece. I would caution people strongly against exploring that and, or, or relying upon that with the family court cases and the family court system as it is, awarding mostly custody to mothers and, and fathers being really destroyed with a lot of that. It, it's very hard to make that case, especially in places like California, for example, fathers have very low rights. Um, but again, I don't think that the prenup conversation needs to be, hey, I am going to get this from you and you don't deserve this. I think it could be a sign of generosity, of kindness, especially if you're doing it at the beginning. This is a contract we are building out of love for each other. But it's also a contract of saying, look, let's let's make these agreements. And then they're so horrible. Let's never go to that place. Let's do all of these five other things we're going to lay out so that we never reach that horrible place so that we both understand how to avert disaster. What are your thoughts on this? Weigh in for us and, and solve this agreement. Because I don't, I'm, I don't I'm think very he and I ever enjoying will. listening to okay. you. Okay. I can see him already taking notes from my future coaching session. Like yeah. my <laughs> next coaching <laughs> session with him, I know where we're going to go. Well, isn't it fascinating <laughs> that the discussion trended toward everybody trying to get the maximum dollar that they could out of that prenup? Or as my brain is thinking, like That's what kindness, generosity, yeah. love, warmth. If this happened, here is how I would still care for you. Right? I that would, is another conversation that could be had. I've written many contracts in my life. Sure. Professionally, I'm required to write and analyze contracts. I have never seen anybody write kindness into a contract <laughs> ah, ever. Well, maybe that's where it's going sideways on us. Maybe while we were writing a marriage contract, it should be built on actual love and care, not this is the minimum that you deserve and I'm going to take the maximum out. That's the that's the spirit right there. There's a best-selling book for a that sold over a billion copies worldwide called The Bible for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sure. there's your rule book. Sure. If, if people, you're a Christian if or, If people you know. would like to base their prenup on the Bible, then that's fantastic. There's plenty of rules in there on exactly how you are meant to treat each other with kindness, generosity, and love and care. If you want to use the Bible as your prenup and you both sign it, fantastic. Now you're going to be bound by it, right? There's a lot of pieces in there, but it needs to be a contract that is based on love rather than exploitation. That's my thought. When people say, Adam, I'm shocked that you love prenups, that's my thought. Build the prenup while you both care about each other so that when you, if you don't care about each other, you are still bound by the rules that you built when you did care about each other. I think it's very interesting because for me, your definition of prenups is the one I've heard my entire life. Like, I'm going to make sure that I don't get screwed if this ends. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's what I feel like most of the world views a prenup as. And with Adam, like, 
I I like the generosity version of it. And I think that if, if it was actually based on that and people actually did that, then it could be valuable for the marriage. My problem is I don't think most people do. No. Like, I think if prenups were a thing that was widely spread, it would be like that. It would be like, this is the amount of money. But I'm let me keep. clarify. And there's something that I am going to now play devil, devil's advocate against myself and say, let's go back to what Adam said. And he said, marriage contract. This is not a legal term. This is actually not a legal practice. Prenups are written by lawyers who will then later enforce them. So mm. this is the biggest issue. The way that we write prenups in this world is written by lawyers working in the worst case scenario to enable their client to have the most successful, terrible, horrendous, awful court battle. They're lining up ammunition and traps and everything to make you win. And this is the biggest problem that people have when they're going against the prenup situation. What you're talking about is you're actually creating um, resolution protocols. You're actually talking about creating catch basins, what if scenarios. Yes, you know, the end of what you're talking about is say, if all of these fails, this is how we will, you know, approach this so we don't hurt each other. I like this. Maybe it's something you can speak about as well as the ability to create a rule for how not to hurt each other, even in the worst case circumstance, that being a benefit. Yeah. But realistically, the prenup that you're talking about is very different from the legal prenup. So Yeah, I agree. It's, it sounds like it's mainly focused on goals and how we're actually going to make this marriage work, which I very much agree with because I feel like most people spend more time planning the actual wedding day than the marriage. Mm. And like, I really like that idea of deciding what the marriage is going to be. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking, as someone who has not been in this conversation until right now, when I hear prenup, I think about lawyers. Lawyers, yeah. And that's usually what I get when, when I post online. I say, look, I am very much for marriage contracts and prenups. Women just go nuclear on me in the comments. Yeah. They say, how dare you do this to us? They're hmm. usually the ones who will get hurt by it. Correct, them. correct. Yeah. And that's what they're used to. Yeah. And then the red pill guys come flooding in. I knew Adam was one of us. <laughs> you finally make sense. All the emotions, crap is, right? But, but and what I understand as a prenup, when people say prenup, go back to like the original marriage contract of a prenuptial agreement, not vicious destructive lawyers have pieces in there here is here is the resolution process as you said if we follow this and we still get to hear this is what will happen if one of us chooses to ignore all of that and just jump into divorce here is your diminished portion right have have that baked into the contract if you jump through and do not activate these pieces you will ex you will get less money in the settlement at the end build that in so that people are forced to go through a different resolution process have multiple stages in that have your lawyers viciously write that out where you will have less because of this but but build that in by all means even if po a portion of your marriage contract is going to be brought into the court and the and this portion is just for you guys mm. fantastic have your lawyers write this portion and draft this but have this portion over here as a longer contract adam do you have a prenup i wish i did ah, and no? not and wow. not, not because <laughs> not because I, my wife and I aren't doing great but i wish i did as a as a guide Mm. It's something that we could lay out and show to other people. Look, this is how we built it. I had nothing when we got together and neither did my wife. And we our, our prenup. Our prenup was the Bible because that was our faith. Look, this is the only circumstances we will ever accept for us doing this. God is to us the, the arbitrating third party, yeah. not, not the state. Right. And these are the pieces that are laid in. And, and we only were able to do that because each one of us said, I would rather lose everything I have than, than violate that third party agreement with so God. You guys are doing fine right i don't understand then you guys are doing fine you never needed that you never fell back against it why are you advocating why even saying that you wish you had a prenup because again to us the prenup is our religious faith and many people don't have that component mm. okay so maybe this is something that we can even kind of say as as a little bit of a temporary resolution if you choose not to have a religious faith it is a choice, you know, if it's something that you say you want to live without, you will have to have something that is akin to it in the form of real world systems. Yes, then you'll need lawyers. Yes, you will then need, you know, some form of a legal document that will guide you. Or if you choose to go without, you need to have something that unites you in such a powerful fashion that no matter what happens, you will always turn to it. Now, I can tell you that really good lawyers can break most prenups. I can also tell you that the courts have the right to override any legal document if they choose to do so. Like, at the same way, I can say that if a person wants to, uh, you know, 
transgress upon their faith or change their mind, they will do that. You cannot stop anybody from hurting you. That is something that is foundational. No prenup will save you from a truly bad actor. Like, and everybody has seen this. Like Celebrity court cases are notorious for that. Yeah. Right? You cannot avoid pain. Nothing will protect you. There has to be something else. I have two thoughts there. Mm. So first, I completely agree with that, that with, with no religion, it's good to have some sort of frame of values and, and systems like this. Because I, I think there's a big trend in the world that doesn't think marriage is necessary, that it's just a piece of paper because it's just an agreement with the state. And mm. a lot of people don't have very good views of like the state. So they're like, why would I want to even agree with that? So I love that idea there. Well, actually, you know, let me interrupt yeah. and say, is there then even like, what is really the point of a marriage? What is the point of a marriage? If a, you know, first yeah. of all, any, any good lawyer can override or challenge it. The other person can hurt you nonetheless. There's now this complexity of prenups and, you know, religious commitment. Why even have a marriage? What's the value? My favorite one's actually from Jordan Peterson on this. Ooh. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> so he said that because you're making this agreement, that's either the state is the witness or God is the witness or everybody that you know is the witness, you are shackled together by more than just your own agreement. And because you're shackled together, you're forced to grow together because both of you are going to annoy each other. Both of you are going to have things that cause the other person to not like you sometimes that they'll have to get over or you'll have to fix. And both of you are forced to grow into more than you can be on your own. Whereas if there's not that extra sense of being shackled together, even when you don't necessarily want to be at times, it's a lot easier to just break that when things mm. get hard. So safeguards. Yeah, I, I view it as the perfect and the best vehicle on earth for personal growth is a marriage. Yep, and I agree with that. It, to me personally, the lack of a heavily written out, well legally set up prenup is the safeguard, right? It is like going for a swim without a life jacket, right? It is sink or swim. You know the outcome is going to be so terrible that it's almost better not to vocalize it. Like, there is no lifeline. You are in, you are in this before God, and you are in this before the law and your children and your family. Like, let's go. Like, that should be, the that should be I believe, the foundation of a marriage is let's go, not now let's talk about if we don't. It's like, no, like, dive in. It's a one-way street. You're not going back, right? And I don't disagree, actually. I am... Um I am of the opinion that no-fault divorce was a massive mistake for our society. I, I think agree. that we need to repeal yes. no-fault divorce. Yeah, I agree. I think that divorces need to be, there has to be a valid reason for violating uh, an oath that you gave, that you would form this this relationship for the rest of your life, yeah. and especially the wounding that it inflicts on children. I think And each other. And right? each other. Yeah. Like, like, I, you really, like... And so, the future partners. I don't understand the Western system. You know, I can slander you and you can sue me, Right. I can say nice, nasty things to you, and you can sue me. I can take the most prized possession, your children, your love, and wreck it, and there's nothing you can do. Right. Like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> How does that make sense? Like, why is it okay for me to attack the biggest and the most important physiological, psychological, spiritual structure that you have with no consequence? Right. This has probably been the most oppressive mechanism that we have set up, which is the removal of the consequence, the removal of the burden of proof. Like, even if I, you know, even if you accuse me of stealing $500 and you took me to court, you would have to prove it. Well, even, even reducing a parental responsibility to finances is what the state has really done, right? Your parental responsibility to your children is financial. Yeah. You will provide cash Everything else will be handled. Who cares what else happens to your children? You have at least given money to the other parent who watches them more often. Who cares what the other parent is even doing? Yeah. Emotional well-being of children is not really tracked in that capacity. It, it's awful how we've done this. But marriage and Until divorce, something happens. Until something and happens. Here's the problem, right? As soon as something happens, and then, then now, now, now we have a quantification of damage. We do not care about children's happiness until they're hurt. Right, that's a downside. I think that's consistent in how we view relationships when we're still in them too. Mm. Like if you've got a business, it's really easy to track your business, how much is coming in and out and let your marriage just be taken for granted and die. And I, part of it's, I think it's 
it's hard to quantify what that is. So we've been, we've become good at tracking these things that are trackable, even though they're not as important, and then making laws around those. But to me, the reason we don't have those laws is because it's not as easily quantifiable. Well, and this is what's so fascinating. Uh, through all my work as a marriage and family therapist, now as a coach and working with couples, one well, of the number one things that they come in to do and that I guide them to do is the number one thing they're most afraid of, that they're convinced is going to break their relationship up, that we, they will get divorced if they do this thing. So I tell them, you must talk about your relationship every single week. You have to have a 15-minute yeah. meeting where you check in and you have a marriage huddle and you say, how are you feeling in our marriage this week? How can we help that go up one point? That conversation right there, most people are convinced that will end their marriage. Yeah. And most people will avoid that tooth and nail. And they'll do anything to avoid having that talk. But if you have it every week, how are you feeling in this relationship? What can we do to improve that? That's it. Have that discussion. Check in. If you don't for 10 years, you're doomed. This is the foundation of learning any skill, right? Realistically, look, they tell you, if you go to, I don't know, name anything, yoga, art class, music, the very minimum that you can do in order to just even inch forward is you have to do this once a week. You know, you have to do yoga once a week. You have to do martial arts, gym, singing, I don't know, cooking once a week in order to do anything. In religion, you have to go to church once a week, to a mosque once a week. Everything is once a week. So if you're actually not having an accountability point, which is actually a skill testing thing, you know, like when you go to church, you reflect on yourself and your relationship with God for that week. And then you go, okay, well, here's what went well and what didn't go well. If you go to a cooking class, you say, well, am I going to make this souffle or whatever the hell it is better than I did last week? So if you're not giving yourself that checkpoint once a week, how do you even know you're going anywhere? How yeah. do you know you're growing? How do you even, how do you know you're even holding steady? And well, it makes so much sense, like with business too. Like if you, if you're like, okay, I need to track my expenses once a week. That's fine. Nobody thinks my business is going to die if I track my expenses once a week. And if you do right. think that, like, you know that you need to. You know that there's something that's wrong. You need to go fix it. And you do. But, yeah, when it comes to relationships, we forget about that thing. We don't think they need right. maintenance. But we also, here's, this is probably maybe the core of the problem, is that we idolize relationship. We turn them into something that is impractical, that is almost divine, you know, in nature, you know, hypocritically it should just so, work out. Right? It is something, it is this golden idol that is to never be questioned, assume it is perfect, right? And uh, it is it is almost heretical if you if you are, you know, a believer uh, in, in anything, especially monotheistic, that elevating something to that level, that it is perfect, never to be questioned, never to be challenged, never to be assessed, never to be repaired, is dangerous, right? That's that's part of the problem that a lot of these breakups happen. They don't see relationships for what they are. You know, they are projects. They are, yes, living entities, but imperfect entities. They're projections of us and our desire for commitment and communication and connection. And it's just not, it is not something that should happen on its own. It is something that has to be built. And I think many breakups and many disconnections happen because we just let things happen. You don't have no ownership, no accountability for it. And going back to the Jordan Peterson quote, I agree with him, and he's very smart when it came to saying that. It is something that keeps you accountable to work on something that is broken, but in with the intent for it to be fixed and better. So would you guys agree with that? Yeah. I think that that's mandatory. Yep. Relationships are something that grow or they die. Mm. Like trees. <laughs> like trees, like a cat. Like your, your, <laughs> your relationship is a cat. Feed it. Treat your relationship Any, anything, as a cat. Every single thing tends toward chaos. Like that's the third law of thermodynamics. And it's totally true with relationships too. And I think one of the hardest parts with, with relationships, with what you were talking about, about idolizing them is some people have the, the idea that because it's not perfect, it should end. Like it's because this isn't what I think exactly it should have been and I'm not open to being curious about what it could be it's therefore not good. And that's why I'm going to end it. Mm. But here's the thing, right? It is a relationship, the gift of a relationship, the gift of the ability to love is very similar to, similar to the gift of faith. When it is given to us, it is perfect. It really, literally appears as like the most perfect form and you look at it and you're just in awe, wonder, amazement, everything. 
And then it becomes a target for you to work towards. So the challenge is that when you are given a relationship and you're first in the relationship, you actually create that perfect world. You are perfectly in love. You have these perfect days, you know, even perfect weeks, if you're really lucky, maybe like a perfect month, where you're creating the vision towards which you strive for the rest of your life. And it's only at the point where you do not wish to work towards that goal that you were given. You know, that, is, that thing is, was real for, for, for a short while, and now you have to go and find it. That's your, kind of your lifelong golden grail. And when you choose to quit that quest, that is when you basically are at the breakup stage. 100%. Right? And it is an odyssey, right? It is something where you're supposed to have your dark nights of the soul, and you're supposed to have, you know, this, this you know, to bring a cinematic perspective, you know, the Sam carrying Frodo to the volcano. <laughs> and I'm sure, you know, you've done this in your marriage, like one or the other, you switch as, you know, maybe you've done as well, right? You really have the feeling you're just dragging the, your partner like by the nose to that common goal. And that is that lifelong building of a partnership that is the most fulfilling thing. And that is what we strive for. And it ain't going to happen if you don't want to work on it. And yeah. if you guess, I guess your message is uh, if you, have not succeeded with one partner, then do not give up on the dream of achieving it again. No, I think that after a breakup, most people can forget that love is worth going through that pain. Mm. They can, because it feels so terrible, like it's the worst pain that you can go through. And they forget how good it can be. And I think you need to start by finding it in yourself again. One of the main things that I talk to people about is letting go and how you can actually get to that point. And People try to let go, but if you actually look at their lives, it doesn't make any sense for them to be able to let go. And here's what I mean. I, I have people separate their lives into five different categories, usually. The categories I choose, and you can, you can change them based on what you think would be best for you, but I choose relationships with family, relationships with friends, religion or spirituality, work or occupation, and hobbies. And I usually have people rate how it was before the breakup and then after. And when we do that, their numbers are crazy higher before they broke up in all of those categories because now they're isolating themselves from their family and friends. They're not fishing anymore because fishing feels meaningless. They're going to work because they have to live, but they're not talking to anybody. And maybe they do feel abandoned by God now because he didn't give them what they thought was the best thing for their life. And then they're saying, I'm having a really hard time letting go of this. I'm having a hard time envisioning finding someone else in the future. All I can do is think of this person. And it makes total sense. Like, why would your brain want to stay in a really crappy present that has no joy, that you don't, un you don't enjoy anything in? And yeah, part of what I do is, is try to get them to pick a small thing in each one of those categories each day that they can do. Like you were saying, it's practice. And if they just do that and they raise it by one point, I find that once they start to get to a point where their life is at least equal with the one they were leaving behind, then it's a lot easier for them to envision that future and dating someone else and being able to let go of this person that they lost. That is a process. It is 100% an odyssey. There's the plan. There's the plan. Man, that was quite the episode. Thank you, Cole. That's yeah. really cool. Um, what is maybe a final thought you can leave us with when it comes to breakup, divorce, like that truly tragic point in somebody's life my life is so much happier now because it happened to me mm. and i'm fully convinced that i could not have designed a life happier than the one that i wanted that i have now the one that i thought that i wanted when i was in that deepest pain is one tenth of the happiness that i have now and it's not going to feel like it it's going to feel like everything that you have is gone and you're not going to know what's in the future, but I can promise you that if you take accountability to do the things we talked about in this podcast, that you're going to be able to look back and be happier than you ever really could be. That's, that's really how I feel about my life right now. Love Amazing. It. Love, Love it. it. Where can people learn more about you? If they need breakup help, where can they reach you? Where are you at? So my website is coachcolezeziger.com. That's Z-E-S-I-G-E-R. And then same thing on Instagram, Coach Cole Zeziger. And then on TikTok, it's just Cole Zeziger. Awesome. Everything is linked below, guys. And uh, do you do courses? Do you do coaching? How do people work with you? Yep. So I do one-on-one -on -one coaching calls, just one-off things if you just need help with a smaller decision. I also do month-long coaching if you want to really make a change in your life. 
And then I have courses on moving on, getting back together in a healthy way, and then also handling how most people text during a breakup and what Ooh. you can understand and how to make it flow well so you have your best chance at actually meeting up and making it work again. Wow. I love that. Thank you. Adam? I'm Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist. You can find my course. You can find my books. You can find my coaching, my community, everything on adamlanesmith.com. I'm also on Instagram, at Attachment Adam. I'm on YouTube, at Attachment Adam. I'm on Twitter as Adam Lane Smith, where we can get in a lot of trouble with some of the cool things and conversations we have over there. Andre, where can people find you? Yep, absolutely. I'm at Andre Korokov on Instagram. You can also look up Veritas Creative Media, um, link below. And this is for our creator community, which is sponsoring this podcast. Um, you can also reach me through the Instagram DMs. If you guys want to chat, that's the that's a good place to find me. Um, and as we roll off, I want to quickly thank our sponsor, Rugged Legacy Grooming Supply, our second sponsor. So thank you for making this happen. Um, guys, this has been a fantastic episode. Cool. Thank you so much for coming thank on. Thank you. Hard subjects. I love it. Uh, everybody, please comment what you think you know your worst breakup story your divorce story your view on prenups your next steps when you come to when it comes to you know continuing life after a breakup i want to hear it all and uh, let's have a conversation thank you for listening to i wish you knew comment like share and we'll see you in the next one